Hello, I'm going to show you how to use Sage on CoCalc um, in a context where you have, where you're doing research and you want some real kind of serious compute capabilities. Okay, so um, Sage, by the way, is an open source mathematical software project. It's based around Python. It's really large and really power and extremely powerful. I started it in 2004 and now 20 years later, it's gotten pretty popular and there's a lot of contributions. CoCalc is an online collaborative platform that lets you very easily leverage um, a wide range of compute resources to work with other people with Jupyter Notebooks, LaTeX documents, and terminals and more. Okay, so this is the CoCalc landing page. I'm already signed in. I'll click uh, your CoCalc projects. And then this opens my projects. I'll click demo for my demo project. And um, here's what I'm going to do. I uh, will first use Sage via a Jupyter Notebook just in the normal CoCalc project. Um, by default, when you do this, you're running on some um, not very powerful shared resources that are part of a big, or rather, actually a really small Kubernetes cluster at Google. And let's do it. So I just click Create. Um, I'll just name this demo, oh, and I'll call it Jupyter Notebook, or I'll click on the Jupyter Notebook button to create a Jupyter Notebook. Okay, and I'll make the kernel Sage Math 10.3. By the way, we have lots of older versions of Sage down here if you need one of them for some reason. Like you want to, like uh, somebody did something in a paper with Sage 10.1 and you want to reproduce it. So we archive many different versions. Okay, so let's click Sage 10.3. And now um, let's just do a quick baby calculation. Factor 2024, the current year. Um, this will start up the Sage kernel. And once it's running, We'll get the factorization of 2024. Um, the CoCalc project, it's using a shared file system. All the software is mounted over the network. And things like starting the kernel the first time can be slow. Um, there's limited memory. So for example, when you look at the upgrades tab here, off to the left, you'll see that the total amount of memory I have is only four gigabytes, which isn't a lot. There's not very much disk space. I'm limited to one CPU. And um, if I don't use the project for 30 minutes, then it just stops. So there's a lot of limitations by default. However, using compute servers, you can eliminate all of these limitations. Um, all right, let's just do another little calculation for fun. I'll make a random matrix with, say, rational number entries that aren't very big. Uh, it's a 10 by 10 matrix. And for fun, let's show its reduced row echelon form as soon as it comes back. Oh, it looks like it's, okay, so it's taking surprisingly long, probably loading um, more stuff into memory. And there it is, okay. Um, so there's our little matrix, and then the reduced rational form isn't surprising. Well, maybe we can raise it to the power of 10. You know, just do very th various things with it. It's super easy. Okay, um, now let's uh, use a compute server. So instead of running Sage on our shared resources, we want dedicated resources. So we can do things that are potentially much more CPU intensive or even combine Sage with something that runs on the GPU. So to do that, we'll click on servers, and then we're going to create a compute server. So there's a bunch of templates. If you click these various buttons, you'll see various um, pre-configured compute servers, and we can just start with one of those and then change anything about it. So I'll click on the Sage button, and I can see that there's a uh, an image with, or a server that costs 17 cents per hour. It has Sage plus optional packages. So it's like Sage with all the optional packages that I could install, pre-installed. It has 16 gigabytes of memory and two CPUs. So let's try clicking that to start. And it uh, has that name. And um, 
Often when you're doing CPU intensive computations, these spot instances work really well, especially if you're doing the sort of computation where um, it's okay if it gets killed after a few hours. So I'll switch to a spot instance. And then going down here, you can change anything you want, like the location. Um, you know, I'm on the west. Well, let's see. Let's try switching. With, let's try playing with location after we choose a more powerful machine. So there's lots and lots of different machines you can choose from here. Um, maybe let's take something with 32 gigabytes of memory and eight CPUs. Okay. And there we can also like click on region and then you see that there's a slight variation in price by the region. I'm on the West Coast, so I'll click US West 1 just because that can lower some latency. And I also like the low CO2. Okay, so that's everything. There's a you can choose like different disk sizes depending on your needs. Um, and uh, the other stuff's pretty advanced. Okay, so let's let's start this up. Okay, so this compute server is now uh, being created. This will take one to two minutes, typically, um, depending on how big your machine is, how big the image is, and so on. Uh, these images, though, and also the location, the images are pre-created on, at least in the case of Google Cloud, as Google Cloud images. So even in a case like this, where it's Sage plus all optional packages, so it's actually pretty big, um, it's still uh, quite fast to start up. So here it goes. It's starting. Um, you can click the log button, or rather, sorry, the serial button, and see the serial console as the virtual machine is being created, which can be kind of fun. So you can see that uh, something's happening. It's just like all the messages flying by. Uh, so that has to finish and uh, it'll go along. Once this starts running, we'll be able to switch our Jupyter notebook and explicitly set it to run on the compute server. And then instead of running with these extremely limited resources like we have over here with only four gigabytes of memory and one CPU, our, single, our notebook will be running with eight CPUs and 32 gigabytes of memory which is a lot more. And it only costs nine cents per hour. So it's really, really affordable. Okay, it looks like it's all booted up. So let's go over here. I'll set the server to be our new compute server. There it is. So we're gonna run our notebook on there. You can just hit enter to take the default. And there we are. Um, we have to choose the kernel on the compute server. So we will. And now let's fire it up. Okay, so it's now starting up. And it should start up much, much faster than before because everything is local to the compute server. The compute server has its own really fast disk. There's nothing um, involving the installation of Sage that's mounted over the network. So that helps a lot with speed. Notice here also, this is going to be a lot faster because any relevant import is a lot faster. Um, and then running code is fine and we you can do like a little shell command and see that there's uh, 32 gigabytes of free memory. It says 31 because of the subtleties of rounding and definitions. Okay, so now we're on this machine and you can also do like um, cat proc CPU info and see that there's a lot of CPUs. Processor zero, blah, blah, all the way up to processor seven. You can also get another tab uh, click new and then click terminal. So by default, this terminal is still on our main project in the normal CoCalc cluster, which it shows it has four CPUs and 32 gigs of memory, but you'll still be very limited in here by, um, by the upgrade stuff that's listed right here. So you really only have four gigabytes of memory total that you get to use. However, if we switch the um, server to the compute server for this particular terminal, then it will move and now it's running on the compute server. You can see that the prompt changed. And when you type top, you can see that you now have eight processors and all of this is dedicated to you. Moreover, unlike uh, the case here, you, so notice if you try to be sudo, try to do some root type thing in the main project, doesn't work. Whereas over here on the compute server, you can happily become root. 
You can run Docker. You can do all kinds of things over here. Um, it's pretty unlimited. So it's much, much better. And of course you can start up your Sage install, which is here and do little things like install packages. Sage dash optional will show you all the optional packages that are pre-installed. Um, I went through and just tried to install everything and a lot of things uh, fail to install with Sage, but this is everything I could get to actually install. So that's nice. Um, so you can see quite a bit is installed. Okay, so the last thing I wanna show you, um, now that we've done this is, what if you wanted to use Sage on a machine with a GPU and somehow combine using Sage with um, some other library that makes good use of a GPU, such as PyTorch. So let me show you how to do that. Um, before I do that, let's stop, or rather deprovision, because we don't need any of the data that's directly on this compute server, this compute server, so it doesn't cost us any more money. So I click deprovision, any data specifically on the compute server itself gets deleted, and it all gets shut down, and we'll forget about that. Okay, so now I'm going to make another compute server that has a GPU. So I'll make a very powerful compute server. And on that compute server, I'm going to install Sage, install PyTorch, and be able to use the two together. Okay, so let's do that. So we'll make a server, click Create Compute Server, and let's go for an H100, which is uh, a you know, state-of-the-art GPU. And there's no um, Sage-specific image right now for our offered H100, but there is a Python Anaconda image. This is an image that has Anaconda pre-installed. It's very easy to use. And you could just create a compute server on here. Um, and we're going to install Sage and PyTorch. Okay, so here it is. This is our H100. It'll cost $5.62 per hour. It's going to run on HyperStack Cloud, and let's get it going. We should expect this to take about four to five minutes to fully get built, um, set up, and running. And I'm not going to edit that out of this video because I don't want you to get the wrong impression of how quickly things work. This is a genuine demo of exactly how it should work when you try it with nothing edited out. So during the next three or four or five minutes, as this starts up, I'll just um, tell you what we're, I'll outline what we're about to do, and then um, that you know, might be helpful as well. So what I'm gonna do is launch this instance, then I'll get a terminal on it, and then I'll use conda to install Sage, which is very easy, you type conda install Sage, takes about a minute or two, and you'll have Sage completely installed in the conda environment. Next, I'll type conda install torch, or actually, sorry, conda install PyTorch, and then we'll have PyTorch installed in the environment. And then we'll um, have various Jupyter kernels that we can use. We'll be able to click on JupyterLab or VS Code button and run either of those servers very easily on this machine. And we'll be able to use Sage and PyTorch together in the same computations on this extremely powerful GPU. Um, I probably won't do anything fancy at all. Maybe I'll just do a, a silly little test involving, I don't know, multiplying two matrices or something like that. But the point is, you may have some sort of interesting uh, machine learning model and you want to combine it with some data that comes out of Sage involving, you know, point counting on elliptic curves or something else. And you can do it all together easily on CoCalc. And all of this stuff I'm showing you is collaborative. You can add other users right here to your project. Um, just put their email address right here, they'll get an invitation. If they're already on CoCalc, you can just add them directly and they'll be able to look at any terminal or notebook that you're working on. Uh, these terminals, um, so notice by the way, this demo, we were using it on the compute server, but now the compute server doesn't exist anymore, so it's moving it back to the default shared resources. And uh, you can use time travel and your collaborators can also use time travel to you know, see all the different versions of the document that you guys are working on together. You can write code in various languages like a.sage, whoops, I meant to write, that's 
not what I meant to type. I can type uh, a, actually I'll just rename it, rename a.sage. So you can make a little .sage file. It'll have nice um, syntax highlighting. Uh, just a little uh, function or code involving sage. You could make a, a terminal that's next to your code. You can type sage, do load a.sage. Uh, maybe it's percent load nowadays. Yep, there it is. And there it is. Oh, let's check on our compute server and see how it's going. Not quite there yet. Uh, let's see how long ago it started. There's a log that you can click on. It logs everything you do with the compute server in terms of starting, stopping, and all the different state changes. So you can see it's been just over four minutes since we created this compute server, and it's almost done starting up. These little progress bars show you what's going on. So it's installed the basic stuff. It's um, set up the file system, and it's now actually pulling a little Docker image that has Anaconda nicely configured into it. And in a moment, it should finish starting up, and then we'll be able to do everything we need to do. And we'll be able to start playing around with installing Sage and Torch. Okay, so it's all started up and ready to rock. So now I will go back to my uh, files and click on this terminal. And uh, actually, neither of these are places where I want to run it. Switch it back to the shared resources. Change the server to my H100, my super powerful GPU. And let's just confirm that we have a GPU, NVIDIA SMI. Uh, Woohoo, we have our GPU. And these, this machine, by the way, is also just very powerful. Look, it has 28 CPUs. It has 180 some gigabyte of memory. It's a very powerful machine. Um, if I do proc CPU info, you can see the CPUs are these AMD Epic 64 core processors. So we have a lot going on here. Um, okay, so let's do conda install sage and torch. Let's see how long that takes. So this is going to um, check the conda forge package repo for the latest version of sage and of uh, PyTorch. I think I might have had to type PyTorch. It's a little confusing because I think in pip, you do pip install torch, but with conda, you do conda install PyTorch. So if it turns out that it says that um, torch isn't available, I'll just change it to PyTorch. We'll see in a moment. Yep, see it's giving an error because it doesn't know about torch. So I just do PyTorch. Okay, there it is. So now it's looking, um, figuring out exactly how to install these things. And by the way, you can easily install Sage, TensorFlow, um, PyTorch, and pretty much everything in the Python ecosystem all together into the same environment in uh, Conda. So here it goes. It's downloading all of the packages for Sage for, and for PyTorch. And this really won't take long. If you want to kind of keep your eye on disk space and other things that are going on, you can just split the terminal and make another terminal that's also on your compute server. You can just keep splitting all you want. Um, one thing to keep an eye on is disk space. So notice I have 21 gigabytes of disk space available. So there's plenty of available space. Um, hopefully, I mean, Sage is pretty big, so watch out, but I think we'll be fine. If, by the way, you do hit a limit in disk space, then you can go to settings and go down to your disk um, right here. See, it says 30, and you can just change this to something bigger, like 50, and it will dynamically enlarge it live without a reboot being required. Okay, and I just enlarged it to 50. If you check back over here, then you'll see that by the way, to toggle this, I'm clicking on the little bar across the top. That toggles um, all this extra information about the server. So now if you look, now it says the size is 47 instead of 29. We now have extra space. Okay. And it looks like it's uh, installing 
some in, uh, drivers related to PyTorch right now. Boom, one minute, 51 seconds later, our Conda environment now has both Sage and PyTorch installed. So that's fantastic. And just a little test of that, I'll type Python in the terminal and I'll type, whoop, that was not good. Let me clear the screen so it looks good. Type Python in the terminal, import torch. Works fine. Let's make sure this is a serious uh, torch. Torch.cuda is available. Yep, it has uh, NVIDIA GPU support. We can do import sage.all. Make sure sage is there, sage.all after 2024. Yep, it's all working, it's all together, that's great. Now let's see what's going on with Jupyter. So, um, uh, how about if we go to this Jupyter notebook? We'll switch the same notebook as before, but we're now going to run it on our um, new compute server. So it turns out that uh, the um, compute server that I ran before on Google Cloud had Sage 10.3 installed on it. Um, Anaconda only currently has Sage version 10.2, and so we have to switch to using that kernel instead. And that's what we'll do. Okay, so we've now switched using that kernel and let's fire it up, see it work. Okay, the kernel's starting and it only took like two or three seconds to start because everything is a local to the compute server um, and now we can use it. But there's a really cool thing. This is uh, a, it's a nice installation because it also has PyTorch installed. So we can do import torch Torch.cuda is available. And um, okay, let's just do something simple, silly. Um, I'll make a random matrix uh, with double precision entries, make it 100, make it, let's just make it small so we can look at it. So I'll make it five by five. It's stupidly small, but there it is. And Let's convert it to PyTorch and ask PyTorch to do something with it on the GPU. So I'll let v be a.numpy. So first we now have a NumPy array and just to throw in a little bit of uh, generative AI so you can see how that works, let's um, use it to do the following. So I'll use GPT-4. Um, I have a NumPy array B and I've imported PyTorch as Torch. Can you transfer? Oh, and I have a GPU. And I have a GPU. Can you show me how to copy B to a, an, um, an array on the GPU in Torch? Then compute the determinant. Of B. Okay, so we can ask it to do that. And now it'll use a call to OpenAI um, to convert our matrix B that we created in Sage to a tensor in PyTorch. Then it'll move it to the GPU by calling .cuda on it, and then it will compute the determinant. And there it goes. It just used the GPU to compute the determinant. And then we can also try in Sage you get the same determinant and they're consistent. Okay, so we, I mean, it's really a ridiculously tiny toy example, but um, you can imagine pulling in some model from um, Hugging Face and then fine tuning it or somehow training it using data that you get out of some, you know, really interesting research computation that you're doing in Sage. Okay, so, um, uh, oh, and at the end of the day, we still have our notebook, it's sitting here. And again, it's all collaborative and you know you can just work with everything together and fluidly move back and forth between machines that are all across the world with a vast range of uh, powers and capabilities while chatting with your friends on the side over here um, and with uh, AI models and everything else. Okay, um, I'm gonna finish by just deprovisioning the server because we don't need it anymore. And then our demo is done. Thank you.